Hey guys, welcome to chapter seven, video two, uh, feudalism. So this video is gonna focus on the structure of medieval society. Medieval society was built on a system known as feudalism. And feudalism is based on this concept known as the feudal contract. A contract is an agreement between two parties. You might have an employment contract or a contract for sale of property. Regardless of the details, what's constant about a contract is that both sides agree to perform, provide, or pay. You know, an employer agrees to pay an employee in exchange for work, a house owner agrees to sell the house in exchange for money, stuff like that. So in this video, we're going to be focusing mostly on the terms of this feudal contract. First, let's fully understand the term feudalism. Feudalism was a loosely organized system of rule in which kings or powerful lords divided their land holdings among lesser lords. In exchange, these lesser lords pledged oaths of loyalty and service. So essentially, it boils down to land for loyalty, right? Land in exchange for loyalty and military service. A king gives land to a lesser lord in exchange for that lesser lord pleading an oath of loyalty and agreeing to fight when called upon. Let me move me out of the way here. So same picture I had on the title slide, but this just explains a little more. The king provides land and the vassal swears fealty. Now fealty is just a fancy word for loyalty right they mean the exact same thing so here you've got your vassal and he is swearing loyalty to the king which is like the top level of lordship that you can get now it's important thing to note about feudalism is that it decentralizes power decentralizing power means that power gets spread out the land that was granted to the lesser lords was theirs to govern and rule kings and higher lords didn't really micromanage meaning tell everybody what to do for everything so it spread power out among the different vassals and lords but this was the best system to keep people in line that medieval kings had since they didn't have the system of government and laws that the roman emperors had so kings gave out land for loyal, uh, loyalty, and the lords receiving the land now became vassals to the king, and the land they received were called fiefs. Fiefs could be anywhere from a couple uh, of square miles to hundreds of acres, and they include everything on it, forests, crop fields, buildings, even the peasants. Now, a vassal is not a servant, and he's definitely not a slave. He owes loyalty and military service, but as I just said, he has full power to run his land however he chooses. Feudalism sets up a system known as mutual obligation, right? Mutual means it goes both ways. It creates this feudal contract. That is the title of this slide. As part of this contract, a king will grant a fief to his vassal and promise to protect him. In return, the vassal will swear loyalty and promise to fight for the king, right? So it's not that only one side has an obligation. Both sides have an, ob have an obligation. Now, this system created a very structured hierarchy. Let's take a look at our social pyramid here. Up at the top, you've got your kings and queens, right? Lost much of their power to the nobles after the fall of Charlemagne's empire. Don't worry about those specifics. Just know that kings and queens, they needed to somehow keep these lords and ladies in check here. So they were part of the noble class, but they were also vassals. Why? Because they were given these titles and lands by the kings. And then these lords and ladies, well, really, we're just focused on the lords because the ladies weren't the ones that were technically owning the land. They could then give out more lands or they could divide their lands in, uh, and make vassals for themselves. Now, they also, as you see here, supply knights to other nobles to fight in battles. Now, the knights we're going to be talking about more in a little bit. They protected nobles as well as peasants and serfs doing battles between the kingdoms. And then at the bottom, you have your peasantry. So the peasants are always going to be at the bottom but we've also got these guys serfs we're going to talk more about them in a little bit but both peasants and serfs they work the farms and they provided tools and crafts for the noble class all right so not too different from the social pyramids that we've seen so far uh but the idea of feudalism about how people are given this land in exchange for oaths of loyalty that does change it up a little bit Okay, so next let's talk about knights and nobles. So for medieval nobles, uh, meaning the upper class, warfare was constant. Right? Rival lords battled constantly for power. And from a young age, these guys were trained to be knights. Now, a knight is a warrior, and like warriors in all societies we've learned about thus far, that puts them in the upper class. They were not the foot soldiers of the armies. You needed money to be a knight. It cost money to dress like this. Just move me out of the way so you can see all of these guys. All right. You needed money in order to afford armor. You needed money in order to f uh, afford the fancy swords and shields and all this other type of stuff. Plus, peasants and workers didn't have time to be trained in warfare. Knights were trained from a young age. 
there we are. Uh, they were trained from a young age uh, to in, in order to dedicate themselves to this warrior lifestyle. Young sons of noblemen would be sent away to what's called squire with a knight. All right, so this young boy here would have been a son of a wealthy nobleman, and he would be sent away from his home to learn from this knight, and this guy would teach him all the ins and outs of how to be a knight. He'd teach him how to ride, he'd teach him how to fight, all of that stuff. And once a young man was dubbed a knight, he was expected to follow a code called chivalry. Now, chivalry required knights to be brave, loyal, and true to their word. There were rules to warfare, such as allowing your opponent time to properly put on his armor, right? If you captured a knight, you had to treat them respectfully. So it was meant to kind of dictate this warrior life. But again, it only really applied to the noblemen. Chivalry did not apply to the commoners. Knights would also participate in what's called tournaments. Tournaments were fake battles meant for knights to show their skills. They could have melees where many knights would fight each other or the more popular joust that you see in the picture here. Excuse me. Uh, joust was where knights on horseback would charge at each other and then try and knock their opponent off the horse. It was a way for knights to uh, practice and hone their skills and also, you know, display their skills when you didn't have actual fighting or war. Talk a bit about noble women. Noble women in medieval Europe played an active role in this warrior society. This was because the guys were constantly off fighting. So the lady of the house often ran the manor while her husband or father was away in some war or military campaign. She supervised vassals. She managed the household staff and made sure that everything ran properly. That being said, her ability to inherit land property was restricted. Land typically passed to the oldest son in each family. So nothing really new there. She could, though, receive land as part as a dowry. Remember, dowries are a gift that is given by the father of the bride on the wedding. So a daughter of a nobleman could come with a big piece of land as part of the marriage. This made daughters of noblemen a highly valued prize among the nobility. Overall, though, they were expected to be mothers and wives, right? They were expected to have many children and be dutiful to their husbands. Now that we've got a pretty good idea as to how feudal society was structured, let's take a look at the heart of the medieval economy, the manor. Now, manors were the lord's estate. Most included one or more villages and the surrounding lands. You look at the diagram here. You've got the manor house in the middle. That's where the lord, right, the nobleman would live. And then you've got all of the, uh, you've got the village over here. All right, you got a church. That's always going to be important. You've also got buildings for the craftsmen. You got a bakehouse. You've got where the blacksmith would be. And then you also have, uh, sorry about that. Then you also have your forest and your pastures and your meadows and all that type of stuff. Okay, so peasants lived and worked on the manor. Now, most peasants were what we call serfs. Serfs were peasants who were tied to the land. They were not slaves, but they weren't, nor were they free. They could not leave the manor without the Lord's permission, and if the manor was granted to a new Lord, the serfs went along with it. In that way, they were the same as properties such as barns and animals. Also, serfs were not paid in money. They were allowed to live on the land and farm it for their own use, but they could only take what was not claimed by the manor Lord. Like with feudalism, there was a system of mutual obligation, this time between lord and peasant. Now, we talked about how feudalism uh, and feudalism, lords and vassals were tied together. So were lords and peasants, just in different ways. Whereas in feudalism was built on the feudal contract of land for loyalty, manneralism was built on land for work. Lords provided land and protection, and serfs worked the manor lord's land. Now, manners developed into what we call a self-sufficient world. Self-sufficient means that they didn't need to rely on anyone else. Manners produced everything that was needed for the people who lived there. Okay, we saw from the diagram before, there was a blacksmith on the manor, there was a bakehouse on the manor, there were fields that they could grow their crops, okay, they could keep all their animals there and so forth. This self-sufficiency, though, also meant that they were essentially cut off from the outside world. Peasants on manors typically lived their entire lives without uh, ever leaving it. Now, this really wasn't for that long of a time, though, because peasant life was typically pretty rough. Uh, they worked long hours doing backbreaking labor. Disease took a heavy toll. Warfare was constant. Plus, if the harvest was bad, manor lords typically did not lessen the amount of food they took for themselves. They took the same amount for them and their families and just left less for the peasants. So starvation uh, was common as well. 
Uh, because of all of this, you know, poor nutrition, backbreaking labor, you know, having your life ended early by disease or warfare, the average lifespan for a peasant in medieval Europe was around 40 years of age. All right, so that gives you a uh, brief but hopefully comprehensive overview of what society and life was like in medieval Europe, and we will pick up with the next video.